holy God of love and grace. We come to you this morning hungry to hear your word, your living word, alive and speaking into the corners of our lives that need it most. So God, we pray that you would open my mouth so that either through my words or in spite of them, you would speak a word to your people and open our hearts and our minds to hear what you would have us hear today. Amen. Amen. The year that I turned 21 years old, I walked into the airport in Houston, Texas on New Year's Eve, carrying a large suitcase and a hiking backpack that I had managed to stuff with six months worth of my belongings. I said goodbye to my parents with a few tears rolling down my face. And I boarded a plane all by myself to fly 5,000 miles across the ocean. My destination, a small city in England where I would spend a semester abroad studying at the university there. Knowing no one and having zero knowledge of English culture or customs, my parents had purchased for me a meal plan at the university canteen where I could eat my meals. The first time I walked into the canteen, I discovered a short stainless steel serving line of food that looked like it had been sitting there for many hours. I scanned my meal card, and the canteen lady dished me out a plate of something, <laughs> although I wasn't exactly sure what it was. I perused the dinky selection of side dish options, and upon selecting both an apple and a slice of cake, a foreboding-looking woman quickly informed me in no uncertain terms that I was forbidden from having cake and fruit in the same meal. I hurriedly returned the apple to its original location. Over my first few weeks in England, I made fast friends with a few fellow Americans who were also there for the semester. Together, we learned where the grocery store within walking distance was, and I managed to stock up on bread and butter so that I could at least have toast in my dorm room if all else failed. My friends and I became instant explorers, trekking all over the city and hopping on trains and planes and buses to go on European adventures more weekends than not. Because we were spending most of our money on transportation, as soon as we arrived in a new city, my friends and I would find a convenience store and we would purchase a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter and hopefully try to score a free plastic knife. We took turns carrying these items in our backpacks. And for at least two meals a day, whenever we got hungry, we prepared peanut butter sandwiches to gobble down as cheap sustenance. I remember being hungry for basically the entire six months of my semester abroad. To be clear, I wasn't actually hungry. I never went without food to eat, but even when my belly was full, the quality and the drudgery of the food left me feeling unsatisfied. 
For many Americans, the feeling of being unsatisfied is the closest that we ever get to true hunger. But for many people in other parts of the world and right here in the United States, true hunger is a very present and real problem. And for all of us, hunger also goes a lot deeper than just our stomachs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is an idea in psychology that human beings have a pecking order of basic needs or hungers that can be illustrated on a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, we have our physiological hungers like food and water and sleep and shelter. And then next, once the bottom rung of hungers are fulfilled, humans will begin to feel a different kind of hunger, a kind of craving for safety, which can be fed through things like law and order and protection. And then once a human is safe, she continues up the pyramid to feed her social hungers, like affection and intimacy and belonging. And if fortunate enough to satisfy those hungers, she moves on to self-esteem related hungers, like independence and competence and dignity. And then finally, if fortunate enough, a human being can move on to feel the hunger pangs in the final echelon of human hunger, needs for things like transcendence and beauty and growth. Now, I'm not claiming to be a psychologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I can identify my own hunger on every level of this pyramid. As human beings, our needs, our hungers are seemingly endless. If fortunate enough to live long enough, many of us will eventually move into a nursing home or an assisted living or require some form of home health care assistance, whether from a family member or a health care professional in our final years of life. Hopefully, if we make it into that situation, our physical hunger will be easily filled. And if so, then different sorts of hunger may begin to arise. If our spouses or our friends or, God forbid, our children die before us, we may perhaps begin to feel an aching hunger for love and connection. Or when we find ourselves unable to do the things that we used to be able to do, either physically or mentally or both, we may become hungry for independence or even dignity. Or as we come to grips with the understanding that we have entered our life's final stage, we may grow hungry for meaning. When Jesus finds himself faced with a crowd of 5,000 plus hungry people, every possible human hunger is present in that crowd. Of course, the people are physically hungry after a long day out, but they are also spiritually hungry. In fact, their spiritual hunger is what brought them out into the desert in search of Jesus in the first place. By the time it's evening, the crowd has been there for most of the day. Even those organized enough to pack a few granola bars or throw an extra banana in their bag are ready for something more substantial by now. Even those who received healing earlier that day are starting to feel a different kind of hunger as the hours wear on. 
it would be perfectly fine, even expected, for Jesus to say, okay, everybody, thanks for coming. Have a great night. Bye. But he doesn't. Instead, he says something unexpected. He tells the disciples that they should feed the hungry people. So the disciples pull out the five bread rolls and two little fish that they have left in the bottom of their lunch pail, presumably leftovers. And Jesus takes the leftovers And he looks up to heaven and he gives thanks to God for them. And he breaks them and gives them back to the the disciples. And miraculously, the disciples are able to feed the entire crowd until everyone has had their fill. And there are even 12 baskets of leftovers. Some people speculate that once the disciples began sharing their own meager leftovers, the loaves and the fishes, their generosity was contagious, and others in the crowd began to pull out their own leftovers to share, providing the miraculous abundance. We don't really know how it happened. The Bible doesn't tell us. But whatever the case may have been, the people's hunger was filled. But it was more than just their bellies. They could have filled their stomachs by going into the town to buy food. But because of Jesus' miracle, they have now also satisfied deeper hungers. For love, for connection, for transcendence. They have been fed with the very presence of the living God. What I find interesting about this story is the way that Jesus performs the miracle. He doesn't just snap his fingers and make a giant buffet table appear. Instead, he meets the people's needs. He fills their hunger through the hands of the disciples. Sure, on one level, the bread and the fish come from God. But on a much more practical and literal level, The food comes through the ordinary hands of 12 ordinary guys who were simply willing to help. Because sometimes, or perhaps rather often, God feeds our hunger through the hands of other human beings. Teachers and doctors and therapists do miracles every day. In the moments before my daughter was born, I remember my doctor, not my nurse, not a doula, but my doctor, holding my hands. She didn't have to do that. That wasn't her job. But in those moments, Through the hands of a doctor who was willing, God fed my hunger not just for health care, but also for soul care. When we are hungry, God feeds us through the willing hands of his people. Sometimes God even uses animals and creation to satisfy our deeper hungers? Have you ever climbed a mountain and felt an overwhelming sense of peace or awe? Or looked out over the ocean and known your place in the universe? Or petted an animal 
and somehow known that everything is going to be okay. When we're hungry, God comes to us in many forms through all of creation and feeds us. There's something about being fed by another that satisfies hunger in a way that simply feeding ourselves cannot. That's why when I serve communion, I like to hand the bread to you rather than having you take it from me. There's something about a home-cooked meal from my mom that fills me up in a way that no other meal can. There's something about a night of sleep in the guest bedroom at her house that refreshes me in a way that no other night of sleep can. That kind of sustenance can't be bought or even made for one's self. It can only be given. That day in the desert, Jesus could have sent the crowds back to the town to buy food. Nobody would have thought anything of it. They could have fed themselves. But that is not what Jesus does. Instead, he feeds them through the hands of his disciples. Back on my semester abroad, I did get to break my peanut butter sandwich diet a couple times. One Sunday after church, a couple of empty nesters invited all the college students in the congregation that they could round up to come back to their home for a meal. I didn't even know these people. It was my first time at the church. But nevertheless, I was there and I was a student, and so they invited me. Somehow they managed to set a table for themselves and about, I don't know, eight or ten of us students Before lunch, they laid out appetizers and poured drinks and made us all feel right at home. When the meal was ready, we gathered around the table and gave thanks and carved into multiple different roasted meats, chicken and beef and lamb. There was gravy and roasted potatoes and carrots, and parsnips, and peas, and Yorkshire puddings, which if you don't know what those are, I highly recommend trying them. They're delicious. We talked, and we laughed, and it was one of those meals that lasted a long time in the very best way. When lunch ended, it was probably three o'clock, maybe four. Our hosts ushered us into their living room, where they served us tea and coffee and some kind of delicious homemade dessert before sending us out on our way again, back to our humble lives in the dorms. I never saw that couple again. But what they gave me that day did so much more than just fill my stomach. It filled my soul. That meal satisfied me on a level deeper than any combination of just food ever could. Beloved, whatever it is that you're hungering for this morning, whether it's food or housing or relationship or healing or meaning or something else, Jesus sees your hunger. He sees it. And he looks upon you just as he looked upon those crowds, with love and with compassion. And as soon as a couple of willing hands are available, he will feed you until you want no more. Amen.